morning, folks. It's time for Neuro 3301. It's me, your old pal, uh, your old pal Harry, back again with uh, another lecture. So, uh, hey, you know, good news. We got uh, one midterm out of the way, uh, one assignment out of the way. Class is progressing nicely. Uh, hopefully you've all decided to stick around to, till the end. And uh, there's only more, uh, more good stuff to come, you know, like another midterm and more assignments. Uh, so that'll be good. Anyway, so uh, I don't have much to say about the midterm right now. The uh, uh, the overall uh, process seemed to work pretty nicely. Um, our TAs are grading it as we speak, so we should hopefully be able to talk about the grades and the uh, kind of distribution and whatnot uh, this time next week. So we'll uh, we'll put that in next week's class and. Uh, Hey, you know, um, no lecture on Monday. It's Thanksgiving, so that's good news too for everyone. Um, you know, but uh, and we're in the heat of the old midterm season too, so it doesn't hurt to take a break now and again. And there's also fall break coming up too, so that's all going to be very nice. But for now, we do have to uh, work and sort of try to focus on learning some things. So let's get right into it. Uh, we're um, officially out of the introductory introductory part of the course and into the part of the course that is exclusively about the brain. Mind you, there's still a lot of things I need to explain about the way this research is done, but now it's going to be applied kind of more directly to the world of neuroscience. So let's begin. Today we'll be talking about <clears throat> the uh, uh, genomic approaches, or genetic or genomic approaches to neuroanatomy part one. So this is going to be a two-part lecture. We'll see how, uh, how long this takes to get through. Uh, hopefully, um, hopefully it's sort of two lectures worth of content, maybe a lecture and a half worth of content, we'll see. So <clears throat> this is something that maybe you haven't thought of or maybe is sort of um, a bit new to you, which is that neuroanatomy is something that is what, like, you know, the oldest part of neuroscience in a sense was cutting up the brain and looking at the size and shape of different parts and trying to, um, you know, name everything and determine the, uh, the cytoarchitecture of every part of the brain and so forth. And you might think that that effort ended, you know, um, hundreds of years ago because newer forms of technology came in and made it irrelevant, you know, made studying neuroanatomy rather irrelevant. Uh, this is not the case, however. Um, the basic structure of the brain is still something that is under active investigation. You know, lots of people are, are looking at, you know, what happens to the brain under certain pathological conditions or what happens to the brain if you... Uh, have a mental disorder or something along those lines. But this is all built on a framework of what is the actual structure of the brain at baseline. Knowing this is, this is sort of the essential scaffolding upon which uh, all the other studies and all the other kinds of knowledge we have uh, is, is built. So that's kind of what I want to talk about today is like how, how is uh, neuroanatomy, the, the overall field of neuroanatomy aided by the uh, in innovations in genomics and then also how is variation in neuroanatomy um, instructed by genomics. So let's, let's get right into it here. <clears throat> so the, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is, is how, um, how genomics methods can be applied to questions sort of adjacent to histology and the cytoarchitecture of brains. And <clears throat> you have to understand that normally when you do an experiment on gene expression or epigenetics in the brain, the way that researchers will find the material they're going to study is with a method called bulk dissection. So imagine a scenario where you're talking about a human brain and you're interested in, for example, the hippocampus. The way this would be done normally is researchers would get a brain out of the freezer yeah, from a brain bank and they would scoop out the hippocampus on, with a scalpel kind of under, maybe under a microscopic uh, aid or maybe just by, by the naked eye. They would mash that part up they would extract the DNA or the RNA or whatever it was they were curious about, and then they would do the RNA-seq or they would do the epigenomics or they would do whatever it was. And, <clears throat> sorry, I got a thing in my throat this morning. Anyway, so this is anatomically more or less sound. I mean, the hippocampus is a distinct anatomical entity. However, you're not really respecting the cytoarchitecture of the region because when you bulk dissect a part of the brain, you're getting your data from all of the cells that happen to be there. And of course, the brain is made up of all kinds of different cells, not just neurons, but glia and uh, vascular cells as well. 
So I'll, I'll give you this problem in, in a way, uh, sort of a, as an analogy, uh, because that's my favorite way of thinking about things, um, to, to con sort of uh, like explicate the limits of these bulk dissection methods. Imagine if you were somebody who wanted to like analyze a football stadium. You know what what you mean by analyze could could be a you know it could it could vary. But let's just say you're uh, you're trying to figure out what's going on with the crowd. So you could analyze the stadium all at once. You would be able to identify you know what team is is favored by most people. Um, when important events happen, when there's touchdowns or field goals or whatever, you just would listen to the crowd. And when you know when they get really noisy, you'd be able to tell oh something important just happened. You might be able to tell what songs uh, or demonstrations the crowd appreciates. You could tell some very broad things about what's going on in the game and what's going on with the crowd. But the average stadium, the average NFL stadium at least, holds tens of thousands of people. It's not studying people as individuals. This is, um, this is the uh, NRG stadium in, in Houston. This is where the Texans play. Uh, but it would apply to any, any, uh, any stadium. So you could, you could certainly take this and, and begin like comparing different stadiums from different parts of the country. Uh, when you're talking about the NFL, uh, you would be able to tell, you know, the east from the west, most likely the north from the south, different sub regions of the country. You could certainly you could certainly make some pretty valid inferences and make some pretty valid comparisons. But you're only talking about broad differences between the regions. Uh, every stadium is full of tens of thousands of individuals. And really, it's the individual differences that are the most informative. They're, however, being completely glossed over by this type of approach. So really what you would want to do if you wanted to you know, have the, the most uh, detailed and robust information about what's going on inside the stadium is, you know, you could kind of imagine conducting like a detailed interview of everyone in the stadium. You could, um, you know, as they, as they file in, you could ask them all kinds of questions, uh, give them a psychological profile, you know, measure it, whatever it is you like. You could measure their physical, you know, anthropometric characteristics as well, height, weight, waist hip ratio, eye color, etc. And, and if you had this for everybody in the stadium, you could kind of classify them into different archetypes. And so this is, you know, purely an example, but you can imagine like there's this kind of person and then there's this type of person and then there's this kind of person and there's this kind of person and then there's this kind of person. And these are just, you know, five randomly selected stock photos of people. But, you know, whatever you're measuring, ultimately you could classify people along some kind of axis. Um, maybe maybe this is you know this is a measure of like how interested in football they are and this guy would be really interested and and maybe um this guy is kind of just there because uh his boss gave him tickets or something like you know whatever it is whatever it is you like but anyway you classify people in some kind of way and then you would count up the number of them or the proportion of them in every stadium and then you would have a measure for every different uh person's phenotype their proportion or their count within each stadium. And so you'd be able to say, for example, oh, well, in stadium A, there's more of whoever this is, this kind of person who, I don't know what, what her deal is, but I guess she's she's got, you know, maybe she doesn't really like football and, or she just thinks the other team is whatever, you know. And then, you know, on stadium B, you've got more of this kind of person. And so maybe, maybe, and then, you know, uh, so maybe stadium B is going to be a bit more fun because there's more, you know, hardcore football fans. Anyway, like this is, purely purely a simplified example but what i'm getting at is that by having data on individual on the level of individuals you have much more precise and informative comparisons uh when it comes to, to comparing the stadiums and the kind of demographic composition now you know it's, it's rude to generalize uh uh and stereotype groups of people so i mean i guess you're kind of doing that a little bit when you're classifying them but rather than saying like oh i don't know all um all, all, uh, all Dallas, you know, all Cowboys fans are, are big jerks. Uh, you could say, well, the proportion of jerks is a bit higher in Dallas, but, you know, it's, it's not significantly different, that kind of thing. So this analogy, if that made any kind of sense to you at all, is very similar to the problem we face when asking questions about the brain or, in fact, any tissue in the body. The brain is a very complicated organ, and when you're doing a bulk dissection method, it's a little bit like just hanging a microphone over a stadium and listening to the sounds coming out of all tens of thousands of people. You'll get some sense of the broad differences, but you won't have any, you know, you won't be able to tell what's going on at the level of individual cell types. How many cell types are in the brain? Uh, we don't really know because it's they can be defined in different ways. You can define cell types morphologically. Uh, pyramidal neurons have a certain kind of a shape to them. Granule cells have a certain kind of a shape to them. Um, 
you know, medium spiny neurons obviously have a medium spiny shape to them. So you can define them that way. You can define them on the basis of their transcriptome, what genes they express. You can define them, and, and, and by the way, if you do that, you'll find that there are subtypes of each of those anatomically or you know, morphologically defined cells. You can define them on the basis of when they uh, develop. Are they recently born or are they uh, born earlier in life? Lots of different ways to categorize cells. That's quite a difficult question. However, we can say for certain that there are broad differences between the major cell types of the brain, neurons, glia, and vascular cells being kind of the top three. And within each of those, there are subcategories that we can all um, pretty much agree on. You know, so for example, when you're looking, when you're talking about glia as a category, you got your all, you got your astrocytes, you got your oligos, you got your microglia, and of course, within each of those, there are many subtypes as well. Um, <clears throat> You know, there's reactive astrocytes, there's uh, oligodendrocyte precursor cells, there's uh, active and inactive microglia. There's all kinds of different subtypes within all of these major types. And then when it comes to neurons, the picture is even more complicated because neurons uh, do completely different things depending on where in the brain they're located. So for example, uh, in, in, in uh, the striatum, one of the major subtypes would be a medium spiny neuron. Medium spiny neurons don't exist in the cerebellum. Uh, and so the subtypes of neurons uh, vary across brain regions. And you can, you know, of course, you can separate them into broad categories based on their neurotransmitters or their morphology or where they are in the cortex, for example, what layer they're in. But ultimately, what you would discover is that there are many, many, many different cell types. And neuron as a single category is, is probably not going to capture all of that variation. But more importantly, a bulk dissection, which is completely, you know, completely disregards all of this, uh, contains an unknown mixture of different cell types. So if you think about it, it will make it very difficult for researchers to discern signal from noise when they're doing gene expression or, or epigenetic studies. So here's an example. I, this is actually um, one of my own photos, but it just shows the concept of co-localization. You've got green cells, which express one peptide, and then you've got cells with red nuclei, which express a different peptide or a different receptor. And sometimes you'll have a red cell all on its own, and other times you'll have a green cell all on its own. And then every so often you'll have a cell that co-localizes, that has a, it's a green cell with a red nucleus. So here, if, assuming these are all types of neurons, you've got three types. You've got green, red, and green red. And this kind of question makes the, makes the whole problem of cell type very multidimensional because gene expression is combinatorial. You can have different combinations of genes, and at what point does a certain combination of genes you know, indicate a new cell type? So I want to give you an example of why cellular heterogeneity can be a, a confound in uh, epigenetic and gene expression studies. So imagine these are two samples that we've extracted from the brain, two hippocampi or two uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortices or whatever part of the brain you can imagine. And you're interested in a gene that's only expressed by the orange cells. Each of these shapes is a cell. So you've got your orange ones and you've got your blue ones. Um, maybe the orange are neurons and the blue are glia, broadly, broadly defined. So the gene is only expressed by the orange cells. If you measure the gene expression in A, there's three orange cells uh, and five blue cells. <clears throat> so you'll get a certain amount of gene expression. Uh, and all of that gene expression is only coming from the orange cells because they're the only cells that express that gene. Now, if you imagine you're, look, you're comparing A to B, B just happens to have more of the orange cells and fewer of the blue cells. So while it's the same number of cells, the ratio of orange to blue or the ratio of neurons to glia is different. And because orange cells are the ones that express a given gene, what you will record is higher levels of gene expression. So, you know, it might be whatever fold higher. But the reason it is, is not because that gene is being expressed at a higher rate. It's only because there's more of that type of cell in your second sample. And cellular heterogeneity is quite variable. If you dissected something differently, maybe you, um, you cut along a different border for samples A versus B, that could be different. Maybe... <clears throat> The samples are of a different age, or maybe it's just natural inter-individual variation. I mean, the number of neurons could vary between people. And it matters because, you, you know, if you're making a point about gene expression, there's a, there's a sort of a biological claim there. Uh, if you say a given gene is upregulated, 
like let's say A is control and B is stress, you could say that this gene is upregulated by stress because you measure higher levels of it in B, but it's not actually being upregulated. Upregulation is distinct from higher expression. Higher expression is only because there's more of the orange cells. So you see, if you're trying to make a claim about the um, biology and how a gene, you know, how gene expression might respond to a stimulus, um, it's completely confounded with cellular heterogeneity. This is a pretty major problem, I think, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to a lot of neuroscience studies. <clears throat> so to, re to reiterate, uh, differences in gene expression uh, when you're comparing sets of samples might be because all the cells in that sample actually do upregulate a certain gene or express it at a higher rate, but it might also just be because there are differences in cell composition between the sets. And because gene expression is uh, cell autonomous and cell type specific, uh, this applies there, and because epigenetics are also cell autonomous and cell type specific, it applies there as well. It doesn't apply, by the way, to anything to do with de like um, just genetic sequence. Your DNA is the same in every cell, so you can you can grab any combination of cells you like, and the uh, the genomic DNA is going to be the same for everybody. But when it comes to things like uh, gene expression and epigenetics, you have to look at the cells you are thinking you're looking at. <laughs> So <clears throat> this is pretty relevant in a lot of different areas. One of the main ones that comes up would be aging because aging is a pro, you know, as you age, you naturally start to lose neurons in your brain. They, they, they die off and decay and whatnot. This is a normal process, nothing wrong with it. Uh, but if you were looking at a young brain versus an old brain and you found that there was lower expression, for example, of a neuron associated gene in the old brains, could you really be sure that this is because all the neurons in the old brain express it at a lower rate? Or is it just because older brains have fewer neurons? This is the, this is the real challenge here. Uh, because especially when it comes to human studies, you aren't, you know, it's not like you're going to get people of all different ages in your study because you're dealing with human brains. You don't get to just pick and choose whichever ones you like. So there's also challenges that relate to things like the uh, var variations in dissection technique, tissue quality. Um, this is usually accounted for by the post-mortem interval. How long was it between when the person died and when you were able to get the brain out? And a whole bunch of other factors. But you know, I think you can see it's, it's going to be kind of a problem when you're trying to make really precise claims about what's happening in the brain. <clears throat> Here's an even worse problem. So we're going back to our example of uh, orange versus blue cells. And let's imagine that you're looking at a gene that you're curious about. It's maybe, you know, you're, it's a stress experiment and you've got control versus stress. And the two cells in your sample respond in opposite directions. So when you stress a mouse, the blue cells increase their expression of the gene, but the orange cells decrease their expression of the gene. So this is a very complicated change. All the cells in your model or in your experiment are responding in a certain way. They're probably responding for valid biological reasons. However, if you just scoop out this piece of tissue and mash it all together, it will seem as though nothing is happening at all because the effect uh, of cells that increase their expression of the gene is canceled out by the cells that decrease their expression of the gene so that there may be no net change despite the fact that all of the cells in your sample are responding differently. So. This turns out to be a fairly sizable problem because you, you know, I mean, you, you never know what's going on in the brain, right? I mean, uh, like uh, different neurons could respond in different ways and this process might cause, um, might cause you to completely miss, uh, miss something important. So, uh, you know, if you, if you have a scenario like this, could you really say, or would it be really accurate to say that a gene was not affected by the experiment? I would say no. I think it's, it's pretty clear that the gene was affected in a very interesting and complicated way, but this would be impossible to detect if you're just looking at bulk dissections. So we do have technology coming to the rescue here. Uh, the high-tech solution that is now increasingly applied today is what's called single-cell RNA sequencing. So at the moment, our best approach to dealing with the question of cellular heterogeneity is to physically separate the cells from one another. Now, one way to do this that's quite commonly used is to use flow cytometry, 
you can actually use facts, uh, fluorescence-assisted uh, cell sorting, to sort neurons and glia into two separate piles. This is something that I do a fair bit in my own research. And that gets you most of the way there when you're talking about the really big differences between cell types in the brain. Taking the neurons and putting them in one pile and the non-neurons in another pile definitely is a major step forward. But you can actually get even more advanced than this. <clears throat> The best way, as I gave or as I explained in this sort of football stadium analogy, is you'd really want to get all of the cells separated from one another and interview each cell as an individual. So th this is the, uh, the, the essence of single cell RNA seq. And uh, the basic way that it works is that you begin with bulk tissue, as you would with anything, and then you can dissociate the cells from one another. You can use a combination of enzymes and physical disruption to take all of the cells and kind of dissociate them so they're all floating freely you would all, this is kind of similar to what you would do if you're trying to do like a cell culture experiment but anyway you take all of the cells and dissociate them so they're floating freely and then through a combination of you know advanced microfluidics you're able to create a unique sequencing library for every cell so every cell is placed into kind of a, a little droplet in this microfluidic system and then every droplet contains all of the reagents needed to sequence the RNA in just that cell. So essentially, if you, you know, if you imagine, it's like doing one, it's, it's like doing a complete RNA sequencing experiment for every individual cell in your sample. And we could be talking about 20, 30,000 cells here. So, you know, no, normally RNA sequencing would be done on a bulk dissection. You would do one RNA seq experiment and you get the data averaged over all of your cells. But with this technique, it's possible to do a separate, mi or a separate RNA sequencing experiment for every single cell in your analysis. And what you'll find then is that every cell has its own distinct gene expression profile. Every cell is an individual, and therefore, every cell has its own sort of profile of gene expression that is based mostly on what kind of cell it is, and then also some stochastic inter-individual variation. And then these data can be uh, you know, um, subjected to clustering algorithms like principal component analysis and T-SNE and UMAP, and you will uh, arrive at clusters of cells that are grouped together by their overall similarity of gene expression. So we'll, we'll see this in practice in, in a few slides from now. But you see the power of this is you're literally taking the concept of a RNA sequen sequencing experiment and iterating it out over tens of thousands of individual cells. This, by the way, is a common theme in kind of all of the genomics technologies that exist now, is you're taking a method that would have normally been applied to a very small uh, small scale experiment with a lot of labor and you're de developing ways to do it on a larger and larger scale that's more and more parallelized. So now instead of doing one RNA-seq experiment for your uh, sample, you would do 20,000. But because the, uh, because the technology is all kind of somewhat automated, it's not as bad as it sounds to do this. Most of the work is really just done on the computer. So let me give you an example of how this method can be applied to neuroanatomy, or I guess maybe more precisely, neurohistology. And this is going on in a lot of different areas right now. I chose this paper by Campbell et al. because it's comparatively early in the field. 2017 doesn't seem like that long ago, but when it comes to genomics, that was uh, like a, you know ages ago. They, um, and and I, I chose them because they study the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus, which happens to be my preferred brain region. Uh, but you can go and look at these types of papers for the cortex or for other parts of the hypothalamus or, you know, you, you name it, the brain region has probably been studied by this method at this point in 2021. So this is sort of an early large scale application of single cell RNA-seq to the mouse brain. Now, before I get into the data uh, that the paper presented, uh, I want to tell you a little bit more about the way the data look in general. The, think about what I was saying uh, about the way that RNA-seq data looks, or sorry, um, single-cell RNA-seq data. In a normal RNA sequencing experiment, and you will see this because I'm going to give you, uh, you know, the, the second assignment, which should be open pretty soon, um, is, is an RNA sequencing analysis assignment. So you'll learn what these data look like. But the basic way the data are set up is you've got genes as rows on your spreadsheet. Each gene is a row. And then you've got columns that represent individual cells. This is in a single cell experiment. So what you start with basic and, and then of course every cell has an expression value for that gene so these are these are uh, scaled values they're not really um they're kind of unitless values that uh that i gave for this example but 
normally you'd get like um, some kind of um, normalized expression value for every cell uh, or for every uh, square in this matrix. <clears throat> but anyway, just think about what that matrix would look like. If you had an experiment where you took, where you measured gene expression in 20,000 cells and you managed to acquire data on 12,000 genes, you would have a 12,000 by 20,000 matrix or a 20,000 by 12,000 matrix. That's a very, very big complicated data set. That's huge. How on earth are you supposed to do a t-test on that? Um, are you going to compare every cell to every other cell? Are you going to do an ANOVA that looks for cell type by gene interactions? None of the normal stuff that you would have uh, kind of would be familiar with for data analysis is going to work on a data set of this complexity. It's multi-dimensional data, folks. So imagine, and so multi-dimensional is not quite as scary as it sounds. It doesn't, you know, to understand it on an intuitive level, you don't need to know any math or calculus, really. But imagine, you know, imagine it in, imagine it in contrast to uh, two-dimensional data. So imagine you're you're looking at two-dimensional data. You'd you'd be able to plot this. You'd have a gene on one axis, and then on the other axis, you'd have a second gene, and you'd be able to describe the uh, the expression of one gene in relation to the expression of another gene. So, for example, here. Olig1 is on the x-axis and Olig2 is on the y-axis, and the two are very positively correlated, so that the more Olig1 there is, the more uh, Olig2 there is as well. These are oligodendrocyte-related genes, so you know if you're an oligodendrocyte, you're going to be expressing both at fairly high levels. That's all well and good. You could do this, but you know, so you could you know you could imagine plotting this gene against this gene this gene against this gene, and so forth, making all kinds of pairwise comparisons. But that's just, you know, it's not really possible to do that on a large scale. You could add a third dimension. So you could imagine, you know, you've got X and Y here. You could imagine adding a Z axis, like, um, sorry, let me just see. You, you sort of have your X and your Y here. You could imagine adding a Z axis that extends into 3D space. But those are, those are very, like, hard to read. You can't, in a, in a two-dimensional printout, it's very hard to represent a third dimension. Another way you could do it is by coloring the points. So here you're plotting SNG or SNHG11, which is a neuron gene against OLIG2. You find that they're not terribly correlated. And then on the third dimension, you have PFN2. And the color of the points represents how much of this that they express. So though this particular uh, cell would express a lot of it, and these cells wouldn't express very much of it. So that's how you could add a third dimension. But when you get to four dimensions, it just becomes kind of ridiculous. You really can't represent four dimensions in any kind of way. Um, but we have a lot more than four dimensions. We have, you know, over 12,000 dimensions because that's the number of genes, you know, that we're, we're looking at here. So you, <laughs> so it's very complicated and very multidimensional. You, uh, you can't analyze it using the normal forms of data representation. There are, however, ways that you can analyze it. Um, and one of these is with a method, or well, one of the ways of representing these results, I guess, would be with a uh, what's called a heat map uh, that's been hierarchically clustered. So <clears throat> here, what you can do is use colors to indicate gene expression. Uh, here, we've chosen just a subset of genes to make the plot readable. But we've got genes here along the uh, column, or along the y-axis of this heat map, and then the different cells. This is an example where I've only got 14 separate cells, so it's very kind of simplified, uh, along the x-axis. And then the transformed, z-transformed expression value is given by the color scale. So cells that are blue um, have very low expression of that gene, and cells that have a red color have very high expression of that gene, right? And then hierarchical clustering is simply an algorithm that automatically arranges the rows and columns to organ, you know, to match um, genes with very similar expression levels and cells with very similar gene expression levels into into clusters, into groups. So you end up with these things called dendrograms that explain, you know, how closely related uh, different cells are to one another. So you can see, for example, these two cells are very closely related these two cells are very closely related. And then those two pairs of cells are quite closely related to each other. And they fit into a broader family that, that encompasses these, uh, this other two, uh, these other two kinds of cells. So you can kind of go down. It's basically a family tree. And the same type of family tree applies uh, here on the uh, y-axis as well. So for example, these four genes, or sorry, these five genes here are closely related to each other. They form a cluster. These two genes are in their own cluster here, and so on and so forth down the line. So this is a way of organizing 
multi-dimensional data to see if any large scale groups or patterns emerge. This is a this is a um, unsupervised method. So you're not telling it anything about the genes or the cells. You're essentially putting this data in in a blinded fashion and letting the algorithm figure out what the best way to arrange them all is. And just looking at it, you can see that certain genes do clump together and you know certain genes are, are enriched in certain cell types. So for example, these genes here and the one that I just circled are all enriched in these four cells. This cluster of genes here is enriched in these three cells and so on and so on. So you can begin to, to build a kind of unique profile of gene expression for every individual cell in your experiment. Now, it's not practical really to do this for giant data sets because it becomes very slow when you're making many, many comparisons. Because essentially hierarchical clustering is making multiple pairwise comparisons and kind of converging on the optimal clustering pattern by just continually comparing pairs to what uh, you know samples to one another so that's not you know that's not really computationally efficient the big o notation would have it uh have it as that and the, the what it would mean really i mean ultimately what, what i'm getting at here is that the processing time for hierarchical clustering is proportional to the cube of the input data size and that's so when you start talking about big data sets it's going to take an enormous amount of time to do this work but for small data sets it can be, it can be quite quick that's, by the way, whenever you're thinking about algorithms, this is, you have to think about like how, how much does the time, you know, how does the time scale uh, with the size of the data set you put in? Because something that's, something that's a very good algorithm but takes you know, centuries to run is not going to be practical. You want algorithms that are decent and also fast. So the answer is, um, or you know, what, what's more commonly used at least, is a type of uh, feature reduction method called principal component analysis. So this is a principal component analysis plot that I made. And our, our little toy data set has 14 cells. And this is a visualization of kind of the deeper correlation structure of, of the data set. It's um, the basic aim of, of PCA, without getting you know, too much into the mathematical details, is to find axes of variation that are orthogonal to one another such that you can capture the maximum amount of variation between samples with with um with a with sort of a new contrived variable called a principal component so in the, the normal way of doing this the first principal component is the uh the axis along which the highest amount of variability in your data set is explained and then the second principal component is the one that explains the next most variability, and so on. And they're orthogonal to each other, meaning that they don't they, the, the amount of the information they present doesn't overlap. So this is a, a way of reducing the features because you can take you know because the first the first few principal components explain almost all of the variability in the data. Now you only have to plot those against each other. You've taken this from a problem where you've got you know twelve thousand by twenty thousand. Uh, you know, 12,000 by 20,000 matrix, and you've reduced it down to uh, a handful of principal components that explain almost all of the variation in the data. So you've really compressed all of that, all of those different genes down to just a, a handful of, of um, larger stru structures called principal components. This, by the way, is going to be uh, something you'll be doing in the second assignment. So this will be, I'll explain this to you a second time. Uh, but but I, I would also recommend that you, um, I'll, I'll show you where to look for, for another uh, more detailed explanation if you're curious. But anyway, this is a way of, it's, it's, it's an approach to feature reduction and clustering. So uh, the, the beauty of this is that now the, uh, the position of a dot or a cell along these two principal component axes captures a huge amount of variation. And, and so just looking at this, you can see that there's sort of a division. A bunch of cells are over here on this side, and then a handful of cells are all the way over here on this side. And what it would mean, therefore, is that there is a handful of cells that are extremely different from all the other cells. Um, over on this side, the second, you know, so these, this might be the difference between neurons on one side and glia on the other. I think that's actually what it is, yeah. So the neurons are just four cells that, that all cluster together. And they appear on one side of the principal component analysis. And then the other side is dominated by non-neurons. And the variation between them is captured by the second principal component. So I'll give you two uh, recommendations uh, for sort of a deeper explanation of this, because I don't tend to be the, the greatest at explaining math concepts, and you're not really in here to learn stats or math or anything like that. So uh, it's not the kind of thing that I'd, uh, I'd want to see proofs or, or too much detail for. But I'll, I'll point you toward this channel. This is a channel called StatQuest on YouTube. 
this is actually a terrific channel if you're if you're learning um, statistics if you're in if you're in a stats class now um, I would highly recommend checking these videos out they're terrific very nicely explained um, a little corny uh, the guy does kind of a little song at the beginning of every uh, every segment but uh, he does a terrific job of explaining things so they can give you both a simple and a more detailed um, an or a guide to the mathematics of PCA and then I really like uh, this is a book by Stephen Jay Gould who I think I mentioned in an earlier class he's a uh, he was a paleontologist who was, uh, you know, a big time proponent of the punctuated equilibrium theory of evolution, uh, a big time cr uh, cr uh, critic of creationism, and also sort of a uh, an early, um, you know, an early pioneer in, I guess, what you might call like uh, social justice. Uh, so a terrific fella all around and he wrote this book called the mismeasure of man which was a response to uh i believe the bell curve by charles murray or maybe douglas murray i can't remember the guy's name but anyway there is there is you know as always there's people who would insist that uh human um very you know human variation in intelligence has a genetic origin and it can be quantified and it, it de meaningfully delineates things like races and sexes and, and other kinds of anthropomorphic groups and uh, this book that he wrote is a response to this. I think it would be very much required reading even today for anybody who's curious about these types of questions, though it's, you know, the book itself is quite old. Uh, but anyway, the reason I'm, I'm suggesting it now, even though I think it would apply to the class as a whole, is that it has a very good non-mathematical explanation of factor analysis, which is essentially a cousin of PCA. So if you like, you know, if you're the kind of person who likes to hear things, or sorry, likes to learn things by reading really good writing, uh, I would look here. This and you know, this is my recommendation. And if you're the type of person who watches videos and learns better from there, um, hopefully you are because you're watching this video. Um, then you can check out StackQuest. I'll say just on, as a side, um, if you're if you're interested in in, in doing science or, or doing this kind of work. The best thing you can do for yourself is taking more stats classes. I'm sorry to say, you know, it brings me no pleasure to tell you this, but there's probably no more important thing you can take uh, at your level of university for your overall success in science than statistics. Because it really, really actually is useful when you start, uh, when you start trying to design algorithms or analyze data or, or anything along those lines. Okay, so back to the paper. Sorry for the diversion, but I wanted to explain a little bit about how the analysis is done. It's part of why we're here to show you the data, but also the methods. The uh, arcuate nucleus is a small part of the brain, but it's very important. It lives in sort of the medial basal hypothalamus, right, um, kind of this triangular uh, section right above the pituitary gland uh, and, and sort of straddling the third ventricle. And it controls a whole bunch of other things. It's, uh, it consists of, you know, a combination of neurons and non-neurons with a very nice anatomical arrangement. It's very precisely organized uh, part of the brain. And normally cells here have been classified on the basis of their location or on the basis of their morphology, where they project to. Uh, oftentimes what neurotransmitter or peptide they express, you know, POMC, AGRP, NPY, these kinds of things. Um, but there's more to it than that. So Campbell et al. back in 2017 used single cell RNA-seq to create a transcriptomic cell type atlas of the mouse arcuate nucleus. So here's what they did. First, they would dissect a piece of the arcuate nucleus out um, under microscopic guidance. Then they would dissociate the cells. This is a hemocytometer just showing that they can uh, count the individual cells that have been nicely separated. Don't worry about this part. This is just how the single cell sequencing was actually done. They dissociate the cells into individual units and then sequence every cell separately. Then what they would do is they would look at the, uh, the relationship between variability and expression level. And they had this kind of sweet spot of genes that are expressed at a fairly high level, but also vary a lot between cells. This actually matters a fair bit, especially for single cell experiments, because you're getting very little amounts of data from every cell, like how much RNA is a cell gonna have. So a lot of variability could just be, be, uh, could be due to the fact that a gene is expressed at a low level. If you have a gene where, for example, you could have anywhere between one to two copies of the mRNA in a cell, very, very low expression gene, a difference of one and two is a hundred percent. That's a huge amount of variability, but the expression level is so low that that variability is almost meaningless on a biological level. You know, it, it's not gonna matter really from the point of view of your cells, whether you have one copy of an mRNA or two copies, that's not gonna be translated in, you know, in any meaningful quantity. So 
you want to have, uh, you know, when you're talking about genes to actually study here, you want to filter out the ones that are expressed at a fairly high level, but then also are variable. I mean, genes that are expressed at a high level but aren't variable, those don't tell you anything, right? Those are housekeeping genes that every cell has. Of course, there's tons of cells or tons of genes that every cell is expressing. So you want this kind of sweet spot of highly variable but also highly expressed genes. Then you subject that to a PCA. This um, reduces the feature size from the normal, you know, giant matrix of data, all you know, down to a handful of of strong principal components. Maybe there's five or ten principal components that explain almost all of the variability. So you've taken the data set down from a you know twenty thousand dimensions down to like ten. That improves the situation considerably. And PCA is quite fast and computationally efficient to run as well. So you don't use you don't lose a lot of time on that. And then you use another method that is sort of similar to PCA called T-SNE, T stochastic neighbor embedding to cluster the principal components into individual cell types. So let's take a moment and, and breathe this figure in here. So what they're showing here, this is the result of the T-SNE clustering, is uh, so every, every point here represents an individual cell. Every uh, point is, you know, the data that, that, that make up that point comes from a RNA sequencing analysis of all of the RNA inside of that cell, or the, all the RNA that's expressed by that cell. The T-SNE method basically works to cluster these cells on the basis of how similar their expression patterns are. So there are a handful of genes that are highly expressed, for example, in, um, well, let's just say uh, endothelial cells here. So there's a group of uh, there's a set of genes that are highly expressed by endothelial cells and have very low expression in everything else. There's another set of genes that are highly expressed in oligodendrocytes and not expressed very much anywhere else. And the same for tannocytes. And then so the closeness of the points indicates how closely all of these cells are or how similar all of these cells to, are to one another on the basis of their gene expression patterns. So Oligos, and then of course the distance between clusters represents how how distant the, the the gene expression patterns are from each other. So all of the oligos express fairly similar patterns of genes and thus cluster together. However, they're fairly distant from neurons because oligodendrocytes and neurons overall express fairly different genes. All these purple ones here are neurons. Um, so you can see like there's another kind of correlate or um, yeah, sort of another um, a co um, what's the word I'm looking for. A corollary to this, which is that when you're looking at all of the cells put together, the different kinds of glia are very, very different from each other. Oligos and ependymocytes and macrophages uh, are all very, very different. But neurons, for the most part, all cluster together. There's almost no difference you know, relative to the difference between, for example, an, a, a tannocyte and an oligodendrocyte. Uh, neurons are almost not different at all. So neurons cluster together in this analysis. So uh, I'll point out also that so this is uh, this T-SNE method is also used in just machine learning and AI to reduce complicated feature sets. So you can apply this to single cell data, but you could also apply this to natural language, um, like embedded forms of uh, of natural language, or you could apply it to images and videos and whatnot. So this is a, a method that's um, coming from a, a kind of a deeper a literature in machine learning and only being applied to the questions of genomics and epigenomics. Anyway, so. The, uh, the authors were able to distinguish 20 transcriptomically unique cell types. So on the basis of their unique patterns of individual gene expression, they were able to create 20 groupings of cells that were different enough from each other that they would be called a separate cell type. And I should point out, this is done in an unsupervised way. The authors didn't tell the computer how many kinds of cells there were. The computer found these clusters on its own by just looking at how similar and how different every sample was to one another or every cell was to one another. So it found this not, you know, the researchers didn't tell the, the computer that neurons and oligos were different. The computer figured that out all on its own. So let me take another break here and, and show you, uh, a t uh, so the, the next figure here involves violin plots. And I wanted to just uh, take a moment to explain what a violin plot is and how to read it. If you have continuous data, which is, you know, data that, um, you know, could be any number, from zero to one or you know any 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 uh, data that can take any value would be continuous data and uh, you can represent it a lot of different ways so of course there's bar graphs uh, histograms would be a way of representing it you can have uh, groups a and b represented on a histogram you'd be able to see the shape of the distribution which i think is quite valuable you'd be, you'd be able to tell where the mean and the median are and how how far apart the distributions are how much overlap there is that's a good way to do it you could also present the same data using a box plot 
uh, and that gives you the median and uh, you can get a sense of the quartiles and the outliers, but you don't get a nice shape for the distribution. However, it's much easier to read. You can see here that B is higher than A and that's uh, pretty simple, whereas here it's a little harder to tell. And then finally, there's what's called a violin plot, which is named because the shape of it sort of looks a bit like a violin. Not really, but sometimes it does. And a violin plot is more or less a combination of a box plot and a uh, histogram, where you can see very clearly the separation of the two distributions uh, because they're plotted on separate, um, on separate lines in the, along the y-axis. But you can also see the shape of the distribution because the, um, the shape of the plot is uh, given by a smooth version of the distribution. So just point that out. It's, a, it's you know, they're kind of a newer way of plotting things, but they're a lot more informative than either uh, histograms or box plots on their own. And so here's what's uh, given by the authors of this paper, Campbell et al. And what they're showing here are the ways that cells in the hypothalamus are categorized by unique molecular identifiers or unique, um, unique genes that are, are sort of specific to that cell type. So let's just kind of go over this chart. And, and by the way, like I'm trying to, kind of what I'm aiming at when I, when I do this type of um, demonstration is I, I'd like you to show you the way I would approach a figure and hopefully teach you to do the same thing. When you, when you see a figure like this, you kind of want to let it like wash over you. It's a bit like, or maybe you want it like, you know, when you're, when you're trying out a glass of wine at the restaurant, you kind of want to, you know, experience it with all your senses. You want to see how it smells and you want to see the, the kind of the viscosity of it and the, the flavor and whatnot. The same is kind of what you would want to do with these complicated figures. There, there are a lot to take in all at once, but if you just let it kind of wash over you and just, you know, engage with it a little bit, you'll find that they usually can be interpreted. So here we have a uh, dendrogram. This is made using hierarchical clustering and they've essentially just shown how these different cell types they identified uh, are cluster. And so nearby cells are more closely related. So of course, all the neurons, all the neuron subtypes cluster together. The pars tuberalis cell types cluster together. The oligos cluster together and so on. And then of course you can see within this, there's a broad separation between uh, neurons and non-neurons. Here, the authors are writing how many of each cell type did they actually find in their original data set. So the original sample had 20,921 cells. Of that 20,000, they found 238 cells that fit into the pars tuberalis number two. They found 10,000 cells that were this uh, neuron six. They found 392 oligo threes and so on. So that just gives you a sense of like the relative proportion of each cell type. And like most parts of the brain, neurons are the biggest component. Neurons make up the majority of the cells. And then the remainder are made up of different kinds of non-neurons, uh, glia and so forth. Actually, in this part of the brain, the tannocytes make up the second biggest portion. Then for every cell type, how many genes did they detect on average per cell? So, and this is measured in thousands. So uh, here they found something like, you know, 3,500 uh, genes expressed per cell uh, in the neurons. Um, here they would find more close to 2,000 and so on and so forth. So how many genes were expressed in each cell type? There are, you know, that's more data. I think that's more a measure of data quality than it is about the way cells work. But this is, uh, this is what they're showing here. And then here, what they're showing are violin plots of the expression of each cell type marker gene. So cell types are defined by their unique pattern of gene expression. But for every cell type, there's going to be most likely one or two genes that are really, really unique to that cell type and really, really distinguish it from all of the others. And so that's kind of what they're plotting here so that you can see with your own eyes how that works. So let's take, let's pick a, let's pick a cell type we can actually kind of wrangle with a little bit. Um, let's see. How about, mm, well, how about neurons? How about we look at the neuron set, right? Neurons one through six. So they found six different subtypes or types of neurons. Uh, some of them were very small number, 37. Others were almost all of them. But if let's look at the cell or the, the genes that are expressed in neurons. We've got TUB3. TUB3 is a well-known marker of neurons. So all of the neurons express TUB3. Then we have, for each of the separate neuron subtypes, we have 
SLC 18A2, that would be a type of um, sodium channel or a type of uh, ion channel, uh, most likely a receptor for something. Um, you can look it up and <laughs> tell me what that is if you're playing along at home. Uh, GHRH, that's the growth hormone releasing hormone. So that would be a subtype of cells that express uh, growth hormone releasing hormone. TAC2 and RGS16, I'm not sure what either of those two are. But you can see that like these, these, uh, these genes are expressed very highly by that subtype of neurons but none of the other cells in the experiment express that gene at all. And so you can see how these are very useful markers for defining these individual cell types. There is a cell type in the brain. Oh, and then I think, um, what's, what's this one? Is this a tannocyte? Yeah, so anyway, sorry, it's a little hard to read this without like having a ruler up against the screen. So you can see that like, some genes uniquely specify certain cell types. Uh, others of them don't exactly uniquely specify cell types. For example, the pars tuberalis cells, all of them express uh, CCK uh, timeless TSHB, and uh, so, so these three genes are expressed in equal amounts, roughly, between the two types of uh, pars tuberalis neurons, or uh, cells, rather. Uh, however, this gene here, CYP2F2, uh, 2 is expressed only by type 1. So you might think that these two types are the same, but actually there is a difference. In other cases, you have uh, genes that are expressed sort of by both kinds of cells. For example, endothelial and mural cells both express a little bit of these two genes. Anyway, you kind of get where I'm going. There are unique identifiers for every cell type, and this plays a big role in segregating them from, from one another. Now, there is some pre-existing knowledge about the way this part of the brain is set up. And you can use this to infer the location of the data that you have. So the cells lining the third ventricle are called tannocytes, and they have some known genes expressed. And you, so, so you can use uh, like an existing atlas of the brain and identify where your, your data are coming from. So let's take, for example, um, SLC17A8. This is expressed by a subset of tannocytes uh, given here. That the, the redder color indicates those cells in the cluster are expressing that gene. And what you can see is that, that particular, those particular cells are all located midway up the third ventricle. There's a, sp a, sp a specific patch of tannocytes called the alpha-1 tannocytes that are located sort of midway up the third ventricle. And they're the ones that express this. And by taking this known anatomical information, you can map it back on to your single cell data. And for all of those red cells in this cluster, you know now where they're physically located in the brain. Uh, ADM, as another uh, example, is expressed mostly along the, uh, the, the, by the beta-2 uh, tannocytes along the base of the third ventricle, and those uh, in the clustering are all located here. So you can map the anatomy back onto the single cell data, and now you have this way of linking. Like, so these, these cells that you used to only know one thing about, so it used to be that you only knew these cells expressed uh, SLC17A8. Now you know a whole bunch of other stuff because you have single cell data on all of them. So you can say all of the cells that exist in this region not only express this gene here, SLC17A8, but you now know all the other genes they express. And you didn't have to think of this ahead of time. It just comes out of the data naturally. Another thing you can do now that you have the gene expression patterns for all of the major cell types in the RQA nucleus is you can say, does this link to GWAS data? So, uh, you know, I've talked about how the GWAS data on its own is a little bit tough to interpret, but the more you, annotation you can add to it, the more useful it becomes. So one of the biggest questions you can ask then is, what cell or organ or tissue is my gene expressed in? If you have a gene that you've identified using a GWAS study, it really helps to know where in the body that gene is expressed. That will tell you a lot about the biological process that that variant probably influences. So you can find a gene like FTO, for example, and you know that it might be linked to obesity. But where in the body is it active? And, and better yet, what cell type is it active in? So cell type specific gene expression is kind of the dream here to take GWAS variants or genes that have been discovered using GWAS and map them onto specific cell subtypes in the brain or wherever else. So the authors did do this analysis and what they found is that genes that are uniquely expressed in neurons, particularly the neurons subtypes four, five, and six, are enriched for genes that are associated with BMI, body mass index. So all of the genetic variants that influence body mass index, many, well, you know, the genetic variants that influence body mass index, those genes are, are mostly expressed by arcuate nucleus neurons. 
So that tells you a lot about, about body mass index, right? Because you could you might think, for example, that body mass index is mostly a product of your fat cells or your muscle cells or your heart or your lung or whatever. But actually, as far as we can tell, most of those genes are actually expressed in the brain because ultimately your brain is what determines the regulation of energy balance. We'll have uh, plenty more to say about that in, in upcoming classes. Let's try applying this now to the question of mental illness. This is, um, we kind of gave a, a sort of a broad view of how you can learn about anatomy. Let's see how this applies to uh, questions about uh, mental illness. So the authors of this paper, which actually came out of uh, Gustavo Turecki's lab, uh, I believe he's at the Douglas or he's in Montreal somewhere. He's probably talked at this at, at Carleton recently. He's um, He's kind of a pretty big figure in the in the local scene. But anyway, they did a uh, single cell RNA sequencing experiment on human post-mortem brain tissues. So these are people who have uh, died for whatever reason, and they've taken the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex out of their brains and done the whole single cell RNA sequencing. It's actually, it's, um, it's single nucleus RNA sequencing. It's a bit different. You take the nuclei out of the cells because um, typically the, the, the cell body themselves, those are destroyed by freezing, but the nucleus is like kind of durable. So you can sequence, you can sequence the RNA in the nucleus, not the cell. But anyway, they did this and they looked at people with and without major depressive disorder. And this is the, uh, these are the cell types they found. So it's the same kind of T-SNE plot. These are clusters of cells that, are, um, that they found in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. You've got various kinds of astrocytes. You've got uh, excitatory neurons here in pink or fuchsia or whatever color that is. You've got inhibitory vasoactive intestinal peptide VIP cells up here. And all of your other favorites are all clustered uh, in various places as well. And now what you can do is you can, you can ask about differential gene expression between depressed patients and control patients, not in the brain as a whole, but within every individual cell type. Because, you know, probably, you know, odds are some cell types are really, are really involved in depression and other cell types probably don't really do a whole lot. Some cell types might just be bystanders. Uh, and this is essentially what they found. So here they're showing fold change between depressed and control uh, or, you know, depressed and non-depressed people. And so, uh, and then here they're showing cell types. So excitatory one all the way up to excitatory 10. They're just different types of excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons, astrocytes, oligos, oligodendrocyte precursor cells, microglia, and endothelial cells. So they're looking at differential expression within each of these cell types. And then the, the, the black points are uh, genes that are not significantly different. And then the circles that have a color inside them are significantly different with the p-value is given by how dark the blue color is. So the darker, the darker circles are the ones that are most significantly differentially expressed. And what they found is that there are a lot of hits coming out of the oligodendrocyte precursor cell 2 category. A lot of significantly differentially expressed genes that are... Um, that uh, b between uh, depressed and control people coming from those cells. So you can take these data and go a lot of different directions with it. As I will explain, or as, as you will see in the RNA-seq assignment, the big problem when you have when you have a lot of differentially expressed genes is you have to kind of fit them into a pattern that explains what's going on. Typically when genes are differentially expressed, it's not in a random way. There's some underlying biology to it that guides what genes are chosen. They fit into some kind of pathway. So one approach to this is what's called disease ontologies. There are people out there who their job is to just read papers and figure out what the papers say about genes as they relate to diseases. So one of the databases is called DisGeneNet, <laughs> Disease Gene Net, or something like that. And what this does is for every gene that they can, for every gene that exists, they just read papers on PubMed and look at when the gene is mentioned in the context of a disease. And they'll extract the sentence that supports this association. For example, the gene CACNA1C, uh, they can just look and this, this has, it's, it's a kind of a calcium channel. Uh, but anyway, there's, it, this gene is associated with 225 diseases and um, there are 22 SNPs involved in it. And it's been referenced from 2010 all the way through to 2019. And if you look at the data that uh, you see, or the, the, uh, the, the citations that they have, they're looking at these papers, all of which have a PubMed ID. You can go read the papers yourself, or you can read the key sentence from the papers. So here they write, uh, these data suggest a role for MAPK1 and CACNA1C in major depressive disorder. 
And then some other people say three samples with major depressive disorder were genotyped for blah, blah, blah. That doesn't sound like a very good study. But anyway, so kind of, the, kind of go down the line. And, and they're essentially showing like manually curated data suggesting that this, the, you know, linking these genes to diseases. So what you end up with, therefore, are lists of diseases. And then for every disease, you have a list of genes that have been linked to that disease. Very, very simple operation, but somebody's got to do it. And then you can take those lists and use an enrichment test, as you will learn about in the assignment, that um, shows whether certain categories of, uh, uh, of or you know, certain, uh, certain um, disease-associated gene sets are enriched among your test set. And essentially what they found is that uh, depression-related genes are significantly enriched among the genes expressed in OPC2 cells. Remember, these are the cells with the strongest differential expression uh, between control and major depressed individuals. And it turns out that many of the genes that people have already linked with depression through kind of unbiased GWAS studies that didn't even consider what brain cells people had, um, those genes are expressed largely in OPC2 cells. So that's a funny kind of connection, isn't it? The um, basically what they found is that you know at least when it comes to uh, the, the the cell types that exist in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex of, of depressed individuals who died, um, it's actually the old fat or um, oligodendrocyte precursor cells or one subtype of them that seem to be the most affected. Now we don't know this is that we don't know that this causes depression. It might be a consequence of depression, but that's a rather interesting finding because I think if you had to take a guess, you probably would assume that neurons are the cells that are the most strongly affected by depression. But according to this, at least, it's actually non-neurons, a certain type of glia that, that where most of the action is. I think OPC2 cells are also known as NG2 glia. Um, although, if you're playing along at home, please please double check on this. But um, there are labs, that, like the Salamoso lab at uh, Carleton, for example, is, is, I think, quite interested in these kinds of glia. So this is stuff that could apply directly to, to work you might actually participate in while you're here at Carleton. So single cell methods are, uh, you know, in, in summary, they're able to discover in a fairly high throughput manner facts about the composition of cells in a given brain region. And this is important as a type of anatomy, uh, you know, used to be that you would go through and look at the brain under a microscope and count the number of cells in every region and, and label it with different kinds of antibodies and, and whatever else and figure out how much, you know, the, the different kinds of cells that live there. Now, single cell methods are adding a whole new dimension to this, allowing you to discover in a totally unbiased, well, <laughs> nothing's totally unbiased, but in a largely unbiased way, what kind of cells exist in all of these different regions. And more importantly, that, so that's, a, that's how the anatomy is characterized. But more importantly than that, these also allow you to localize disease-associated variants uh, and gene expression changes to particular cell types. So now you can begin linking GWAS studies to specific cell types. And this is quite a valuable, uh, uh, quite a valuable concept because you know, we understand the genetics of disease to a certain extent, but it's only, you know, that, that knowledge of genetics is pretty, uh, it's, it's not very definitive if you don't know where in the body to look for the biological process that they're contributing to. You know, it's one thing to you know, it's one thing to know a gene, but you got to know where it's expressed to know what's going on. And uh, so there are surprising discoveries, right? Uh, I don't know if anyone would have guessed that uh, the, about the potential involvement of oligodendrocyte precursor cells in major depression. If you'd probably, I mean, if you, I mean, I think that was actually somewhat known before this. I think it was, but. So, you know, it, it wasn't a totally out of left field guess, but it's kind of neat to see it validated in this manner. So in the next lecture, we're going to learn about uh, what I would call pseudohistology. So this is uh, kind of continuing this, this, uh, this way of applying genomics to neuroanatomy, showing that, that uh, there's, you know, in addition to single cell sequencing, there's also something called spatial transcriptomics that you're going to learn about. And then we're also going to learn about how brain anatomy itself is influenced by genetics. So I believe that's my, yeah, so that's my last slide. Uh, yeah, so we finished a bit early today, which I'm not going to complain about because I have a meeting to go to right after this. Uh, the next lecture is going to be pretty interesting. I think we're going to learn all about the connection between neuroanatomy and face shape and spatial transcriptomics and all of that other good stuff. So, so um, yeah, lots to lots to look forward to. Uh, lots to look forward to in the next lecture. But I guess the next lecture isn't for a week, folks, because we have uh, we have um, we have Thanksgiving. So. <laughs> 
Uh, hopefully you'll all enjoy your long weekend. Let's see here. Oh, so Natalie uh, writes, um, the statement is from a paper in uh, Nature Journal, NG2 cells, also known as polydendrocytes. Mature oligo... Oh, so yeah, let me just look at this, yeah. Oh yeah, so NG2 cells are oligodendrocyte precursors. Uh, thank you. I was uh, yeah, <laughs> it's good. Yeah, so I, I was um, I was right about that. That was just a guess that I pulled out. But yeah, people have different names for things sometimes. I guess uh, uh, you know you can define them on the basis of the expression of NG2, uh, or you can call them oligodendrocyte precursor cells. Uh, you know the real experts uh, in the field probably would have more to say about the distinction between that. But all I would want to say is that uh, this is stuff that we're actively studying here in Canada locally and uh, in kind of the broader Eastern Canadian region. So if you're interested, there's uh, there's things you can do. Anyway, my friends, uh, I'm going to leave it there for today. Uh, please, uh, like I said, please enjoy your long weekend. Don't, don't worry about the midterm. It's over now. You can forget about all that stuff. Well, actually don't, but you know, don't have to be stressed. Just focus on your other work for now and the assignment. And we'll see you all back here in a week's time. Thanks for listening.